Psalm 139, beginning with verse 1. O oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake, I'm still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, your word is truth. We affirm that today and we declare that. We also confess that we are broken and we are in desperate need of you. Thank you for the hope that we have in you that we don't have to be the same people tomorrow. We don't have to be the same people tomorrow that we are today. Use your word, Lord, the power of your word, the truth of your word, the teaching of your word this day to heal our brokenness. Bring us wholeness through it. Thank you for Petey and his family. Empower him this day, Lord Jesus, as he teaches us. And guard his heart and his mind from the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can we give it up for Sherwin? Love you, man. Hey, why don't you turn around and meet some people around you. Give some hugs, some high fives. Introduce yourself. If she's single, get her digits. Go. Hey, it's Baptism Sunday. Who's excited to celebrate some baptisms today? Baptism is the public declaration of a, of a private decision you've made to start following Jesus. And uh, we got some people that are going to do that today. We had two people in our first service that got baptized. That was incredible. And so we celebrate that. Yeah, that's big. That's big. And I think it's good, it's good for us to know, like when we talk about giving, when we say like financial giving and we say, hey, like this church doesn't happen without your generosity. Like this is why we give. 
Like we give for life change. We give for, if you were here last Sunday at our 11 a.m. service, the story of Danielle who got baptized at the end of service. The stories that we are gonna see get baptized today. Like, man, we don't give just to keep the lights on like, and the building going. We keep the lights on the building going so that people can come here and discover who Jesus really is. And, and people are doing that every single week. And so, man, uh, continue to give. I just wanna encourage you in that. Uh, you can give on our website. We got wall boxes in the back of the room. But let, uh, let, let's keep giving big to fund and fuel this mission uh, that God has us on. Because, man, he's changing lives. He's changing lives. Um, but today, I want to bring you a message uh, out of Psalm 139 that Sherwin read to us, which, by the way, I'm just saying, Sherwin, you better warm up them vocal cords more often because I'm going to start every service off with Sherwin reading and praying. I need Sherwin, I need Sherwin like, to be my like, alarm clock. Like when I wake up in the morning, I need Sherwin's voice reading over me as I wake up. That'd be the good life. Um, I wanna bring you a message today from Psalm 139 that we're calling, the more things change, the more they stay the same. All right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I, uh, I was sitting on my back porch several weeks ago. It was on Tuesday morning. Tuesdays are normally my like, uh, sermon prep day um, to just get away from everything, kind of unplug and see what God's saying and, and get, get everything ready for preaching and all that. And so I was sitting out real early in the morning. I was, I was up before my kids got up. I was out in that Colorado sunshine, which, which, which y'all know, like if you're new to the area, if you just recently moved here, um, which we actually had a lot of people last service, several people last service that had just moved here, you need to watch out because this Colorado sun will get you. Like, you're like a mile closer to the sun here. You sit down and think, it feels cold outside. You're going to be a lobster by the end of the day. Um, so I'm sitting out there enjoying the sunshine, getting a little bit, a little bit fried, and um, and, and, I, and I'm writing down, I'm just spending some time with God, and, and I wrote down this phrase, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I started just thinking about my life, and I started thinking about everything that had changed in my life over the last, like, year, five years, 10 years. Right, like, go back in your mind for a second, 10 years ago, and what was life like for you 10 years ago? 2011, like, my, my life was totally different. Everything had changed. My wife and I didn't even have kids yet. We got three now. We had no kids. It was date night every night. It was amazing. I mean, so much in my life was like, 10 years ago, I was coming out of my first bout with depression. I was, I was coming out of burnout from ministry and not even wanted to be in ministry anymore, but God had led us to go to this church in the middle of nowhere, small town Kentucky, and be a kid's pastor. And I'm saying, if there's one thing you don't want me to be at this church, it's your kid's pastor. I love my, somebody said amen. Taylor, shut up. <laughs> I love my kids. I, I tolerate y'all's kids. No, I'm kidding. I love your kids. I'm kidding. <laughs> but legit, you don't, like, you don't mean to be the guy singing and kids ministry guy. But that's what we were doing. And like, like our life was so different. I remember the apartment we lived in. Like the apartment we lived in 10 years ago. I remember because it made my wife so mad. Because So a little pro tip, if you're newlywed, don't ever sign on to a lease agreement to a place that your wife has not seen yet. That's bad news. I saw it on Craigslist. That was probably mistake number one. It was a Craigslist ad for an apartment. It was dirt cheap. I show up, I sign the lease, and I go, well, we show up, and there are two things I remember about it. One was, uh, there was something wrong underneath the house, underneath the apartment. I'm not sure what it was. I'm not sure if there were like dead bodies under there, but every day you'd wake up, and like the carpet would just be a little damp, just a little wet, and you're like, oh. Like we had to wear slippers and sandals at all times. You never wanted your feet to touch the carpet. The other thing that really made her mad though was, uh, I remember we were moving in, I'm like unpacking boxes in a different room, and I hear from the other room, she's like, hey babe, where's the dishwasher? And I'm like, girl, that's a dumb question. Dishwasher's in the kitchen. She's like, no, I'm in the kitchen, there ain't no dishwasher. And I was like, oh no, did I, did I sign for a lease with a house with no dishwasher? And I did. We ate on paper plates and paper bowls, plastic color, for an entire year. I was like, I'm not hand washing these things. Not an animal. We just we bought the plastic plates for paper plates nonstop. But like so much had changed. I'm gonna, Ten years ago, th think about this. In the world, who was the most popular musical artist at the time? The, the people who made billions off of us listening to them. It was LMFAO, Party Rock Anthem. We made these these bozos bajillionaires. That was awesome, Michelle. That was perfect timing. That was what happened, that was 10 years ago. All right, think, think five years ago. Go a little closer. I know that's a long, long time. Think five years ago. Think summer 2016. Where were you? What were you doing? 
Five years ago, summer 2016, uh, my wife and I just moved to downtown Indianapolis to help start a church in the middle of the city. And they told, us it, they told us it wasn't possible. They told us it would never be successful. And we moved down there and we had about 100, 150 people as a core group of people that were committed to praying for the city and loving the city and, and sacrificially giving and serving. And, and we just kept believing that God wanted to do something big. In this. And, we had no, and everyone told us it couldn't happen. And we saw in the middle of that time, God take 100, 150 people. And on opening Sunday, we had over 1,500 people there. And God just exploded this thing. And it opened my eyes to what God can do when a, when a group, it doesn't even have to be a huge group of people, when a group of people come together and they just commit themselves to the mission, they pray big prayers, they give big, they serve big, and they just love people. God can do so much with even just a small group of people. And I had never even experienced anything like that before. But five years ago, that's what we started to experience. I mean, five years ago, we didn't even have our little baby girl Tatum, the, the one who rules the roost in our home had yet to be born, right? Everything was different. Five years ago, summer 2016, there were rumblings. Y'all remember this. There were rumblings and rumors that a reality show celebrity could be elected to be our president. Yo, that was a rumor. Everyone's like, no way, it won't happen. Surprise. That was five, that was five years ago. Think, think back just a little closer. Go back one year. Where were you a year ago? I'll tell you where you were. You were at home doing nothing. The whole world is at home. And no, like the, the thought of a vaccine, we hadn't even heard that a vaccine was possible yet. That there was no end in sight. We hadn't been at church together in months. That was a year ago. If you've been at this church for like a year plus, you, then you remember what happened last year at this time. Last year at this time is when we gathered some people together, about 100, 150 people in a room together, it was the first time we had gathered anyone together for church. And we said, hey, I know this is crazy. I know this is insane. But we feel like God is leading us to like do something insane during this pandemic. We feel like God has given us this opportunity to buy our first permanent home at 1710 Dublin Boulevard. And somehow, some way, we don't know how we're going to afford it. We don't know how it's going to be possible. But we think we should start praying and giving towards this. And then I said, I said one of the dumbest things I've ever said in front of a group of people. I said, hey, we need to raise $1.8 million in like 60 days. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm out. <laughs> there's no way. Like, just go ahead and like, there's no way this is gonna happen. And I, I remember like with our elders circling around, like Frank, you remember you were there. We, we stood outside this building when it looked like that. We stood like right up here in the corner and we laid hands right there on the building and prayed that God would give it to us. And about 100, 150 people in the room pulled together. And all of a sudden now you are, you, are, you are standing in a miracle. Like this thing should have never happened. That's, look at how much has changed in a year. That's amazing. And look how far you've come, right? Like forget like the, the, the world suffers. Like, and just think about you personally. Look how far you've come. 10 years, five years. One year, like I know, I know the world is hard on you. I know the world beats you down. I know the world is discouraging to you in so many ways. And I know you're always probably your own harshest critic, right? Like you're the one that's always saying, man, I should be better, I should, but hold on a second. Look where you are right now. You're in church. You did it. <laughs> you, like you could be out in the mountains. You could be doing anything. 10 years ago, come on, five years ago, you would have laughed at the thought of you being in church right now. But you're here. Like you're doing so much better than you think you are. You have come so far. So much in your life has changed. And I believe that that's the kind of moment that the author of Psalm 139 is having. I think the author of Psalm 139 is having a moment on his back porch journaling a little bit and just reflecting on how far he's come, how much he has grown, how much his perspective has changed. Look at it, he says, he says you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways, God. Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is, is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. You see, he's come so far. He used to think, like as a young man, he used to think God might not even exist. Like some of you are here right now and you, you question the existence of God. 
And, and you're not alone in that. There's other people, there's other skeptics in this room, right? There's a safe place for you to process through your doubts and your skepticism. But he's come to this place where like, as in like previous years when he was a younger man and life went bad, he'd have looked up to the heavens and said, God, if you're even there, which I'm not even sure if you're there, could you help me? Like he used to just be so flippant towards the reality of God and now he's grown. I mean, gosh, look at this. He's like, I know you're with me at all times. I know you're with me. I've lived too much life. I've seen too much. God, you're, you're always with me. You're always present. He says, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the, and, and the light become night around me, even the darkness won't be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. See, as a young man, he used to think that God was optional. Right, God's like, take it or leave it. Like, if you want a new hobby, go to church and get yourself a hobby. If you want to read a book on theology, like, if, 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 you, want, if, if you want to choose God as as a new thing in your life, that's cool, but God's kind of take it or leave it. If, if you leave it, you're not really missing out on anything. That, that's maybe how he used to feel as a younger man. Then he lived some life, and he's come to this great realization that you can walk out of a church and never come back, but God is not gonna stop pursuing you. Like, y'all know the reason that some of you are here right now, in fact, I'd say all of you are here right now, is because God got you here. Come on, in the 21st century, you don't end up in church on accident. You got plenty better things to do with your time. The fact that you are here right now is proof that God is pursuing you. And let me tell you, if you walk away from him, he's, he, he's gonna be the rock in your shoe. You're not gonna be able to shake him. And, and the psalmist has said, I'm, I've come to accept and embrace that. I can't, I can't outrun you, God. You're after me at all times. I might as well embrace him. You just look at how far his perspective is so developed. He, he, he says this, he says, you create me. Listen, this is such profound theological insights that he has grown to. He says, for you, God created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And, and I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body before anyone. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they'd outnumber the grains of sand. When I'm awake, I'm still with you. See, as a young man, he, he may have looked at the world around him and thought arrogantly, this all got here by accident. Right, He may have looked at the world around him and the body he lives in and been like, you know, like his peers, like the going philosophy of the day, like the going sentiment of the day is like, I mean, come on, this, like, this all happened here by chance. No, no, no. Now he's lived and, and he's seen and he's, he's humbled himself away from that arrogant position. And now he looks at the created world and his created body and he knows that it's proof of the existence of God. Like right now, some of you are doubting the existence of God. Let me tell you, the mountains you get to see every day and the body you inhabit was meant to be the proof that not just an agnostic God, not just a God that is like random, spins the world into existence and then kicked it out and backed away. No, no, not that kind of God. The, the intricacies and complexities of your body and the mountains you see every day were meant to show you that, that God is a masterful designer. He created you with intention and purpose and detail it's the proof. It's the proof you wake up and walk in every single day. I mean, look at how far he's come. He's got such profound depth in him, such profound spiritual growth that he's experienced. I'm telling you, if some of y'all would start following Jesus, you would experience that same kind of growth. Like when I hear Sherwin reading and praying, my first thought is, man, I wanna be like that when I get, when, when I get older. Like. I want that kind of depth, I want that kind of insight, I want that kind of wisdom, right? I'm telling you, you follow Jesus, that's, that's what happens. You, you've come so far, so much has changed. However, y'all know the title of this sermon, the more things change, what is it? 
the more they stay the same. Because all that growth, all that amazing progress, all that depth and insight, and then all of a sudden the next verse, uh, hard right turn. The next verse is like, huh? Like the first, the first verses are like Hallmark card. That's like Facebook cover photo. You get you a picture of a sunset plaster, that on it. Oh, grandma's gonna be so happy. She's gonna like your cover photo. It's gonna be amazing. But then this next verse, it's like a head scratcher. It's like, huh? He says, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intents. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you? Hate's a strong word. And abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them, and I count them my enemies. Say what? I thought we were all like holy and spiritual. I thought we were all like, Jesus is awesome and everything's loving and kind and good and let's float on the clouds. You talking about bloodthirsty? What? You see, this is, this is a really trippy part of reading the Bible. Because like when you read the Bible, especially the Psalms, you come upon things like this and it's really tempting to read that and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Does that represent God? I mean, because it's in the Bible. Does that represent God's heart? Does that, like, is that who God is? Is God looking at people who are in opposition to him or who don't believe in him as enemies and, and he wants to kill them? Is that God? And that, that, that's why, I, but you, you got to remember what the Psalms are. The Psalms are like journal entries. The Psalms are the writer being raw and real and writing down their thoughts. And, and right here, we got a raw and real thought that is in direct opposition to the heart of God. Like we got amazing spiritual knowledge and depth and progress and change. Everything has changed. But then there's like, this is not, like we know this is not God's heart. What he just wrote is in direct opposition to God. We know that because of what Jesus said. Like, like we, we always say Jesus was God in the flesh. If you wanna know what God, looks, what, what God is like, look to Jesus. And Jesus said something that was like completely opposite. He said this, he said, but to you who are listening, I say this, love your enemies. Whew. That doesn't sound like the psalmist. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, let them slap the other one. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. Go suns out, guns out. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. Because if you love those who love you, I mean, what credit is that to you really, right? Because even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, I mean, what credit is that to you even... Even sinners do that. If you lend to those who you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? I mean, come on, even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. No, no, I say love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. See, the heart of God I mean, aren't you grateful for this? Aren't you grateful? The heart of God sees your rebellion and my rebellion sees our mistakes. And he does not meet that with, with punishment. Instead, he meets that with mercy. He meets that with grace. He meets that forgiveness. I mean, is there anybody that's grateful that God knows everything you've ever done and he loves you just the same? Is there anybody grateful for the grace of God, his mercy, his kindness, even though we're stupid? Come here, y'all know sometimes we're stupid. And, and God's like, no, I love my, I, I know, I know, I know. See, the psalmist's heart is in direct opposition to God's. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I just got to envision that this was something that wasn't new to him, right? This issue that just came up in the text, you know what this is? This is something that likely he dealt with his entire life, this anger and rage that turned into hatred, Right, because that's what this is. This is a, um, the psalmist sees the culture, he sees evil in the world around him, and he sees people that are, that are doing things that are hurting people, 
And his anger and rage towards the sin, his anger and rage towards the evil, his anger and rage towards the enemy that's controlling them spilled over into a hatred of people. His, his, his anger and his rage spilled over into a violent outburst. And I just envisioned this is not the first time that he had written something like that. I just envisioned that maybe his anger and rage had spilled over when he was parenting his young children. And his anger and his rage had spilled over into arguments and disputes that he had had with his wife. And his anger and rage had spilled over and, and he'd gotten too hot in the moment, too heated in the moment with some coworkers over a disagreement on a project they were on together. Like this is not the first time he's dealt with this. This is something he's been dealing with ever since he can remember. The more things change, the more they stay the same. You ever, you ever think to yourself, you ever say this to yourself in a moment of weakness? You ever say, man, I thought I was past that. <laughs> I thought I was past that. I thought, I thought for sure I'd be done with that by now, right? In, in, um, in, in our house, we, are, uh, we try to have healthy-ish foods around, which means we don't buy the good cereal. That's all that means. I'm a big cereal guy. So if you told me like, what's the one food you want on a deserted island? I always get confused, side note. Is it deserted island or desert island? Nobody knows. It's both. My one food for that island would be cereal. But we don't, we, we don't, we don't really, like the, the closest thing we get to the good stuff is Honey Nut Cheerios, right? We don't get the good stuff. But then a couple weeks ago, we were at Costco. We're walking through the aisles and we see the big box of Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Cap'n Crunch and Berries. And our kids are like, can we please? I'm like, sure, let's do it, let's do it. And all of a sudden, like I thought I was past this, because back in college, I'd eat a bowl of cereal before bed every night. I mean, that was just like standard. There's nothing better than a 10 p.m. bowl of cereal. Love it. And I'd eat one every single night. But, but, but then, you know, once I got married to Brittany, she kind of whipped me in the shape. No, no, I can't, can't do that. Like grown men shouldn't eat Captain Crunch and Berries every night before bed. That's not good. But then I found myself, once it's back in the pantry, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm either pregnant or something because I'm craving Captain Crunch and Berries every night at 10 p.m. What is wrong with me? I thought I was past that. Apparently I'm not past eating like a child. I thought I was past that. Like, I thought I was past not being able to sleep on Christmas Eve. How many of y'all still can't fall asleep on Christmas Eve? Oh man, my people. I thought once I became a lead pastor and started having to preach Christmas Eve, right? You gotta preach like service after service after service after service. I thought for sure I'll, I'll be able to sleep like a baby on Christmas Eve then. Nope. Like my body is tired, but my mind is like presence. Let's go. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. Thought I was past that. Thought I was past that. You, you ever think that when you look at, at, at the world around us? Like, I thought we were past that. I thought we were past racism. Uh-uh, surprise. Just because it's not in the news, just because the talking heads aren't talking about it, just because there aren't protests right now, racism's still alive. Surprise, thought we were past that. Uh-uh, not quite yet. Like, I, I, thought, I thought we were past political division. Election's over. Uh-uh, not so fast. Still there. I thought, I thought the pandemic was over, right? I thought, I thought that means like, because the pandemic's over, masks are gone, vaccines are out. Like, doesn't that mean that we should be past isolation, loneliness, and anxiety? Surprise! It's still there. It's still right here. We're still dealing with it. And, and much more than a problem we see out in the world, it's a problem we see in us. I mean, come on, many of us, I speak to the adults in the room right now, students in the room right now, you are right now working through things and you're experiencing things and you're developing habits and tendencies that if you aren't careful, will become lifelong issues. Many of us in the room right now, the adults in this room, are dealing with insecurity. And it's the same insecurity and it's the same feelings that we started having in middle school. It's the same junk. Many of us are dealing with an image management problem that started as an elementary student when we started exaggerating the truth and lying a little bit to impress people and, and just twisting and warping the truth a little bit to get a laugh. And now here we are today, still cutting corners, bending the truth, exaggerating at work to impress our coworkers. I mean, come on, like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Some of us are dealing with broken, brokenness in our hearts, bitterness in our hearts that we have been carrying for 20 years. 
And, and, and it's, it's there. It's still there. Like, I, I've still got all, I'm telling you, when I was sitting on my back porch writing this, I wrote, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I started reading Psalm 139, and I started listening to all the things that God had changed in my life, all the ways that he had grown me. And then I started going, but man, dang it! I'm still the same, in many ways, I'm still the same young man that was struggling with things when I first came to Jesus at 17, struggling with the same old stuff. I'm still, I'm still struggling with fear of the future. Fear that at some point the other shoe is gonna drop. Like things might be going good, but that, that can't last forever. Right? Even though I've seen God's faithfulness time and time and time. Just this past Tuesday, we had, a, we had an elders meeting, the, 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 the overseers of our church. And uh, Sherwin was there and our, our, our other elders were there. And, and they were asking me, like, how am I feeling about the future? I'm like, well, man, I'm good. I'm a little nervous about the next two years. I mean, we had a good past couple years. Look at this building. But I mean, how long is that going to keep going? And they were like, why are you nervous? Why are you worried? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> It's the, same, it's the same thing I've been wrestling with my whole life. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I'm still having to fight for purity of mind, purity of heart, for integrity, just like I did when I first started following Jesus. I'm still having to fight through bitterness towards people who have wronged me in the past. And you'd think, oh my gosh, you would think after preaching the gospel of grace and forgiveness time and time and time and time and time again, that at some point it'd seep into my freaking heart but it doesn't. The more things change, the more they stay the same. See, what I've learned about myself and about many of you as I hear your stories and as we continue to journey together as a church family is that some of the deepest wounds that we've ever experienced, some of the greatest weaknesses, some of our greatest flaws that are still hurting our relationships, hurting our jobs, hurting our mental health, some of the greatest weaknesses that we have in our lives we, we continue to allow them to exist. We continue to hide them. And we just kind of get used to them. It's like we see such growth in so many areas and then there's like these few really, really big flaws, these really big things, these really big areas of brokenness in our lives and we just never overcome them. And then we learn to excuse them. Right? Enneagram is a great excuse. Y'all know I've cracked on Enneagram before. I got a love-hate relationship. But see, I'm, I'm old school enough to know not just Enneagram, but Myers-Briggs, ENTJ. I'm old school no, enough to know strengths finder, activator, achiever. You can, you can take them all, right? But come on, at the end of the day, sometimes we use these personality profiles to excuse some of the largest and most, most um, dis, uh, destructive areas of weakness in our lives. I'm an Enneagram 8, so now I've got permission to be a jerk. Like, no, man, Enneagram 8 is called the challenger, not the jerk. You can be a challenger and not be a jerk, <laughs> right? Enneagram 9's out there. You're like, well, you know, I'm a 9, so that's why. That's why I, you know, really worry about what people think about me, and I really, you know, manipulate the conversation to make sure I don't step on anybody's toes, and I really worry about how people felt about that interaction afterwards, and I, I try to go back and make sure everything's good. You know, I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. I'm a 9. No, 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 hold up. The 9 is called the peacemaker, not the people pleaser. Those are different things. Okay, don't, don't use that to excuse this. But it's because these areas of brokenness and weaknesses inside of us have, have hindered us for so long and they've caused us so much pain that we just have to figure out a way to live with them. Right, some of us just get comfy with them. Some of us get, some of us, like, it, it is our identity. It, it, it is who we are. Like someone at a young age spoke over us like, that, oh, you're, you're, the, you're, you're the funny one. You're the one that's always gonna say the thing that makes people laugh. You're the one that's gonna like push the boundaries and you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna be the kind of rule breaker, rebel, that's you. And you're like, I guess that's me. And so you just keep doing that. Or like, oh, you're a worrier. You know, it's, 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 maybe, maybe a family member, a friend said, oh, you're just a worrier. You worry a lot. And that, that becomes who you are. You allow something that someone else spoke over you to become your primary identity. And you just get, you get comfy with it. Because at the end of the day, guys, I think most of us are convinced that with our greatest weaknesses and flaws, the darkest places of our heart, we are convinced that God can't actually fix it, that God can't actually heal us, 
And so there's no point in even trying. There's no point in even trying. We just learn to embrace it and accept it, right? You know, Jesus, Jesus used to ask a really funny question. If you, if you read the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus oftentimes would come up to people who had been dealing with something their whole lives. Like he'd, he'd come up to a guy on the side of the road who had been blind his entire life. He'd come up on a, on, on a guy who'd been crippled his entire life, unable to walk. And he'd ask a really funny question, kind of silly. He'd say, hey, do you wanna be healed? Do I want a million dollars? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, I wanna stay, stay blind, sure. But you see, Jesus asked that question for a reason. Because he knew that sometimes we just end up living with it. We get so comfortable with it, we don't even, we don't even think to ask God for help. We don't even think to allow God in to heal the deepest and darkest wounds of our hearts. I'm telling you, God, God not only wants to heal you and mend your brokenness, but he is able to. God is able to put back together the things that this world has torn apart in your life. God is able to help you overcome the struggles and temptations that you have never been able to overcome. Do you know, I mean, come on, do you know how messed up our theology would have to be if he couldn't? <laughs> I mean, come on, we believe that God can raise people from the dead, but not help you stop being a jerk. We believe God can, with a spoken word, the mountains just pop up. Mountains be mountains. And it's like, but yet he's gonna really struggle with your insecurity. He's gonna really struggle with your lust problem. He's gonna really struggle with the fact that you can't stand being single. He's gonna really, I don't know, that's probably too much for him. Come on, that's insane. That's crazy theology. See, God not only wants to heal you, but he can. He's able to, he's able to. But only if you and I will do what the psalmist did. Only if you and I will do what the psalmist did. We must give God access. We must open up our hearts, open up our minds and our lives to God and say, God, I've never been able to overcome this. I've never been able to beat this. I've never been able to change. I've never been able to prove faithfulness. I, I keep falling time and time again. I just keep running into the same issue over and over. But God, I've held that back from you because I've assumed you can't do it. And God, now I'm going to choose to give you access to the most difficult places of my life. That's what the psalmist does. He has this moment where he reflects and he sees all this change. Then he sees this really ugly area of part of his life that's not in line with God's heart. And then he gives God access. Look at how he ends the psalm. He says, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God. I give you access. See if there's any messed up thought patterns in me. I give you access. See if there's anything deeply embedded in my mind and my heart that I have sworn up and down that I don't have a problem with, but yet people keep pointing it out as a possibility. I give you access. God, I, I, I give you access to my unresolved bitterness. That person that I've never been able to forgive, I don't even wanna think about him again. God, I'm gonna think about him again. And I'm gonna give you access. God, my, my heart and my mind that has been so ruled by the ways of this world, the mentality and the thinking of this world, God, I don't know how to change it, but I, I give you access. Is there anything in me that's broken that you need to fix? God, I give you access. God, I, I give you access to my finances, my money, the thing I've worked so hard for and I worry about so much and, and I, hold, I white knuckle it. And God, I, I work too much and, and, and I, 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 I just stress about it. And God, I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna give you access to it. I don't care if generations before me have all dealt with this. I don't care if it's been in my family tree. God, I give you access. Start a new family tree. Start something new in me right now. God, I give you access. God, I give you access to my relationship, my dating relationship, my, my marriage, my singleness. I give you access. Just do the thing in me that I need. God, do, do something miraculous in me. Heal me of it. Jesus, I give you access. 
You see, that, that's what I believe so many of us need to do today, is that maybe for the first time, we start to have hope again, that God can heal things in our life that have been crippling us for years. That we give God access to every part of our life. And you know, that's what it means to say that Jesus is not just your savior, but that he is your Lord. You know, Lord's not a word we use a lot. It sounds like a old British thing, right? But look, you know what it means. It's just like master, the one who calls the shots, the chief of your life, the one who rules you, the one who governs you, the, 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 the Lord of your life. See, Jesus didn't stretch his arms out on the cross and die just to give you a monopoly get out of hell free card. Right, like, that's, that's, like no doubt, Jesus died so that your sins could be forgiven and you could be with him forever, absolutely. But man, that's a slice of it. Jesus didn't come to just die for you and resurrect from the dead to be your savior. He wants to be your Lord. And when you give God access, that's you saying, Jesus, every area of my life, you're worthy of it, you died for me, I give you access. You know, for many of you, that's what getting baptized is. Um, baptism is not what saves you. Right? This is not the moment you get saved. When you get these, that's, that's, the moment you get saved, the moment you are forever changed by God is the moment you say yes to Jesus in that private conversation between you and him. The moment you say, Jesus, I believe that you are who, who you said you are and I believe that your sacrifice forgives my sins, that's when you're saved. That's when Jesus is your savior. Baptism is when Jesus is your Lord, right? Like Jesus commanded us as the first sign of lordship, the first sign that we'll do whatever he asked us to do. We'll even get into the water in front of a whole bunch of people and publicly declare our faith. That's showing that Jesus is your Lord. And some of you, that, most of the time, that, those decisions are together. Right, most of the time you start believing in Jesus and the first thing you do is get baptized, they're linked. But for many of us in the room, that's not been our story. We might've said yes to Jesus a long time ago, but we've never been baptized, that's just too weird. Or maybe we grew up in a faith tradition where that wasn't even something that happened. But this is a, this is a tangible way that you say, Jesus, I'm not just in it for the forgiveness of sins. I'm in it, when, when you say jump, I, I'm in it to say how high. When you say run, I'm gonna say how fast, how far. You're my Lord. And, and I wanna give you the chance to respond in that way. We're gonna celebrate a few people that are getting baptized today and I believe there, there could be more. We have, we have everything you could need. We got shorts, shirts, brand new clean undies. We got everything you could need. But it's the time for you to symbolically say, I'm in and I'm gonna follow you wherever you lead me. And I believe that some of you need to make that decision today. I think some of you need to just have a moment with God where you give him access to some parts of your heart that you've never opened up to him. And so we're gonna have a, a time of response and worship where we just do all that. We're gonna sing, we're gonna open up our hearts to God, we're gonna give him access, and then we're gonna do baptisms. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for us in just a minute. I'm gonna walk off the stage and go out those back doors. And if you want to get baptized today, just meet me out there. We got everything you could need. And so let's respond to God today. Let's, let's let today be a moment where we walk out of here and Jesus has greater access into our life than he's ever had before. Let me pray that for us. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We love you, we love you. You're so good to us. And we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago. God, it was a long time ago that you did that, but it's just as real today as it ever has been. It's just as significant and just as powerful as it ever has been. And so God, we, we come together in this room today just to celebrate your love, to celebrate your forgiveness. And God, I pray for courage right now for our church, that they'd have the courage to, to do what our mission says to do, which is to follow you fearlessly. God, I pray you'd give courage right now for people to open up their hearts and to give you access to things that they never thought could be healed before. God, we open up our hearts to you, open up our minds and our lives to you. And God, I pray for anybody in the church right now that is new to this, but they know that you're the way, the truth, and the life. They know that they're not here by accident and they're ready to say yes to you. God, I pray you give them the courage to walk out those back doors. 
And God, I pray for anybody here that's maybe been following you for a long time. I pray for courage for them. If they've never been baptized, just the courage to step out in faith and to do what you've called us to do as a sign of obedience, to make you the Lord of our lives. Jesus, you're the Lord of our church. When you say go, we'll go. And um, that's our commitment to you because of all you've done for us. And so God, we open our hearts to you in this moment. We love you. And we ask you to meet us here as we worship you, as we celebrate life change together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.